monster, so that's 43 minutes worth of material. We got, we got a group coming in, and what happens typically is we don't have a target audience, so I'm just gonna put that out there. We get people from all walks of life. College, professors, military, uh, sometimes it's fun. I'll team the tracking team, sometimes I'll team up the Halliburton guy with three tours in Iraq with the Earth First operative and the long hair, and they'll become tracking buddies for five days. And what happens is they usually get along amazingly well. So one of the benefits of going outside with a bunch of people is outside is our ancestral common ground. It doesn't matter where you're from, what language you're, you were raised with. Being outside is, well, it's in our genetic code. So we use that as our, as our starting point. And this spectrum isn't, you know, Words are hard. You know, there's that saying, there's statistics, and then there's, right, there's lies, there's damn lies, and then there's statistics, right? So this is a heuristic model, meaning it's an oversimplified, lame attempt at trying to capture um, or track where we're heading as, as a school here at the Maine Primitive Space School, but hopefully uh, you'll, you'll find some pieces that are useful for where you're going with your students, your, your audience on YouTube, whatever, okay? So on one side we have this raw form Western modern entity called Homer Simpson, who goes to you know dutifully goes to work in the morning, comes back, has issues with traffic jams, the the rate of increase with taxes and tolls, and is looking forward to the weekend or telling stories about last weekend around the water cooler, and is always being chased by a predator called the clock. Okay, so this is our raw form modern. Uh, subspecies Homo sapien domestico fragilis. Right? I have, I live in that environment. I reflect that environment. Homo sapien domestico fragilis has an excess of calories, and this is what it's all about. It's all about your calorie budget. So let's say that we start to go outside, and we notice that it's kind of cool out. We're like, whoa, this is amazing. I like this. I don't know why I like this, but I'm going to try to do this more. Right? If you're a kid and you have an active troop, your Boy Scout level school skills will include some experience cutting yourself with your pocket knife, chopping with random abandoned trees with axes, and if you're lucky, you, you, you nick your foot but you don't cut off your toe with your hatchet or your axe. Uh, burns around the fire, but usually it's really hard to light a fire. Lots of smoke, wet newspaper and leaves, and maybe some Boy Scout water, also known as kerosene. And the more you do that, the deeper into the levels you get, you start to become field smart. You know how to set a tent peg at an angle so that it doesn't pop out. You know how to get a fire going with the different types of fuels and arrange things. You start to get seasoned. You stay in it any longer, you become a mentor with the younger people, the tender feet, who are just new to it, wide-eyed and wondering, but still cut themselves with their own knives. But you've been there, and you've seen the trends, and you start sharing it. And after a while beyond that, you become an elder with it. Not the 35 to 40 year old scoutmaster who is caught in the rat race, but the 60 to 65 year old grandfather who's been in it through his entire life and can cook a nine course Dutch oven meal out of all of the stuff off the landscape whittled, you know, hanging pots with pieces of wood with branches and notches and coming up perfect. And it's effortless. So within each of these categories, this isn't a spectrum, this is a path toward a developmental ideal. And for our school, the ideal is to take the raw form, modern human being who craves a connection with some thing, whatever that might be, and bring them through a process toward that hunter-gatherer nomadic level of connection. That's not to say abandon any modern tools, it's to say let's transcend our dependency upon modern tools so that when we have them in our hands we're not only proficient, we're thankful. And if we lose them, we're still going to be okay. It's a tall order. It's a tall order and, and it's a journey. And within that journey there's all kinds of divergencies, you know. The reason that this is the path that the school takes is because it was the path I took. You know, I wanted to go to the military to learn real survival leaving the, the Tom Brown influenced Boy Scout troop in the Pine Barrens of Southern New Jersey and finding out that it was a completely different approach. You go in with all of your equipment in the hopes of being rescued as soon as possible. There was no foundation and understanding of plants, tracking, bird language, rock tools, stone, nothing. 
No time to make cordage. You go to these schools and there's periods of instruction. You will, without aid or reference, be able to, without assistance, blah, 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 blah. There's all these bullet points, right? X amount of people, X amount of time, with an expected attrition rate of about 20%. Don't make it through injury, or they just couldn't grasp the concepts, and they get either recycled or booted back to their unit. Okay, cafeteria style. And, and that's not good or bad. I mean, there's a lot of people who took that and ran with it, especially after Vietnam. They disappeared into the woods of Northern California, some of them here in Maine. And you know they did well with what they had, usually coupled, however, with PTSD issues and some other things. Within this realm, I know people who are field smart because they're passionate. They love what they're doing. Right? I'm really familiar with the um, personalities within those circles. I'll just leave it at that. There are others who are like just doing the job, man, and they don't show up for the specialized training. They will pour out of the vans when they get here to play in the woods. But the ones who are passionate, their body language is like, let's go, let's do it. The ones who, they have to come through as a part of the training cycle, you tell they're like, right, closed body language. Master main guide. Master main guide goes a little bit deeper than the military survival for one reason, and that's timelessness. All right, actually there's more than one reason. Timelessness and the idea of the hunter-gatherer nomad by traveling, you learn more. You're just more aware seasonally. You have this opportunity to slow down and be present and wander the woods without time or destination. People pay you, sure, to go fishing, hunt, and find that bear, whatever. But during your downtime, when you're scouting, you're just letting the canoe take you where you need to go, or the trails, or the sun, right? And you start opening up a little deeper than is even permitted in Sears school or military. <coughs> military level training. In the military level training, you're running from point A to point B for certain objectives. It's very goal oriented. Now think about goals. What do they do? You have to achieve this, usually within a certain period of time. And that causes tunnel vision. Instead of going point A to point B, we're trying to open up people to this sense of, it's not really multitasking in the way that we see it. I mean, there's no such thing as multitasking. Every time I see a car that's ahead of me drifting on the line, it's either someone who's had too much to drink or someone on a cell phone. Right? There's no such thing as multitasking, but what we can do is approach it through an organic, multi-directional, sensory experience where I'm looking for my shelter, but on my way I find this medicinal plant, these perfect rocks, this amazing throwing stick, and this piece that's probably going to be my spindle and my fireboard. And I'm going to put them next to the big tree where I find my site, and then I'm going to start building my shelter. And I'm going to spiral outward, you know, rake up all my debris. But on the way, I'm setting aside that fishing view, you know, the fork stick that's just perfect. It's got to put some barbs on it. Does that make sense to you? It takes practice, and you can't do it in a day. And you can't learn it on a YouTube video. In fact, it, it's, it's a lifelong pursuit. But when you get through this, and somewhere over here is Tom Brown. He's an anomaly. I don't know what to make of that guy because I've been there enough to see things that I can't wrap my head around. But I know beyond Tom Brown is our ancestral hunter-gatherer nomadic um, heritage. It's already genetically in us. How many of us as kids played where you pretended to be an animal? Yeah. Or How about build forts? Shelters, right? Shelter buildings in there, uh, shape-shifting, for lack of a better term, or imaginative tracking role-playing if you want to be really, you know, psychologically safe with your terminology. Um, hero's journeys, going out on adventures, even if it's a towel tucked into your shirt and you're jumping off the couch with a broom handle, you're going on these amazing journeys. So we've already got this raw material to turn Homer Simpson into something that they're craving. We're not telling them what to do or what to think. We're saying, here's the sweet tools that have been laid out for you by your great-great-grandparents. And they did it because they were passionate and they loved the people that they were nurturing and bringing up, your great-grandparents. And it was handed down over the generations for you to do the same. How do we get you as fast as possible from Kemlon Bliss to that Nayaku. And Nayaku is a term that captures that sense of being completely plugged into your landscape without any thoughts in your head and having a knowing that the deer are around the next corner. Or that when you turn your head, there's something staring back at you. It's that atrophied feeling of connection and 
being watched and forgetting something that we call our subconscious, but it's opened up wide and it's used as our primary source of information gathering instead of this. This is just a piece of who we are. We use this to read it in the book to get the, okay, opposite leaf pattern, double tooth, and then we go out and we start getting intuitive. It looks like a battle. I better bring this back. And you find out that it's not only not the plant you thought it was, right, but it's a look-alike that will cause blistering to you. Example, you ever hear the shrub U, Y, E, W? Nice, very attractive, juicy red berries, very succulent. They, they even look like miniature olives, and the seeds are lethal. We have kids, I was one of them, who pulled up scallions and ate dandelions and put them in their mouth all the time. How come we don't have kids dropping like flies? from those little delicious looking yew berries, right? How many of us as kids took those berries, picked them, smushed them in our hands, and we're like, it doesn't feel right. Yeah? So there's something there, but it's not reliable. It's not reliable because for 13 years we sit still just like you're all doing right now and listen to somebody blab. So the other part of the construct is we can't teach this way. This is not teaching. This is sharing oral story, and ideally it should be about the physical experience we all share in the rain trying to get fire, right? Or the shelter where we got tore up by mosquitoes, but we made it through the night, and some of us even had a comfortable night's sleep. That's what this part is supposed to be, not the only way to learn, right? So part of what we do as a school is data dump, get it in the noggin, go out and do it. And be prepared. Say, you know, you have your spotters ready because you don't want to put people too far beyond their comfort zone. Even if they're not in physical harm, psychologically you might scare them out of the woods forever. So I'm not going to take that kid or adult who's never been in the woods before and pretend to be lost in the swamp as the sun's going down. But I'll do it to Jim Kane. Because that's his edge. Right? Does that help? When you start mentoring, one of the first things, and it's, you know, you do this in your occupation, you start reading nonverbal cues and body language and, and word syntax and eye contact to better profile your students so that you can serve them better. Where is their edge with this? And we do this through all types of primitive hunter-gatherer technologies. One of the big ones is the art of, of uh, questioning. And it only works, all of them, only work if it's from a place of authenticity and sincerity in your heart. If you feel like you're being smarmy or cheesy with it, or like a used car salesman, you're doing it wrong. Right? You gotta be totally on board and, and passionate about what you're doing. And it's easy. For me, it's easy, because I've got kids. So all of you folks who are here, everyone who comes to this door, they're, my, they're the role models for my children. Right? They don't even know they've been drafted as that. But it wasn't me who drafted them. Them showing up. When my kids walk out of the house, the first thing they see is humanity. And their baseline expectation is what they see when they open that door and come outside. And that's you. Right? So that puts a tall order on me, the parent. So there's my ownership into it. I need to share from the best place I can be at all the time for my people, these people, you, because I can't teach my kids. I'm a parent. You ever try to teach a kid that's yours? Yeah, They're like, yeah whatever. Right? Especially when they're teenagers. It doesn't work. But he's cool because he doesn't have kids yet. You know, college age kids are like gods, small g, to adolescent you know, kids who are fifth, sixth, eighth, tenth grade, and they're gonna listen to anything they say. What pisses me off is you'll say it a hundred times. This guy will say it once, and then my kids will think it's law, right? I told you that. Yeah. But they were finally in a place to hear it from a different person. And with that, it never turns off. So you start, I mean, when you start realizing, these are all primitive hunter-gatherer technologies, right? When you start realizing that, you use real life as your teaching agent. When my, my father died, I made sure my son saw me crying uncontrollably at the top of my stairs. I needed them to know that you need to value these emotions because it's real for you. Right? And part of that was also realizing, heck, how next? They're going to go through what I'm going through now. Right? And so you start handing down. Um, so in this journey, we got people who want to go out and live in the woods forever. I mean, that seems to be everybody's dream as a kid. It's the reason I joined the military. 
It's the reason I did martial arts. It was all about being super woods ninja, right? When you finally get to a place, or as close to a place as you can get with that, let's say you have an amazing weekend. It's fall. There's all kinds of food on the trees and on the ground. You, you get lucky and get some fish and a squirrel with a throwing stick. It's the best weekend ever, and then suddenly it dawns on you. After six hours of building my shelter and getting a fire, I've already fished and hunted and foraged this place out. I got enough food for two weeks, but I gotta start this all over again. And dang, winter's coming. And that's when it hits like a lead balloon is, you can't do it on your own. Rambo doesn't exist, it's a fictional character. Yeah, you could do it for a little while, maybe 20, 30 days, but even the scouts came back to their village. It takes a community of people who are aware, nature literate, plugged in with hard skills and soft skills, who are moving seasonally throughout an area. And this is where we hit a roadblock. Hunter-gatherer nomadic. We're overpopulated now. We can't all go out on the land and forage and become like a blight or else we're going to live in a desert. And there's existing models to prove that out. You know, we used to have jungles all over the place in the middle of our planet. And when we gave people tools without birth control, <laughs> they started farming and staying in one place and their population exploded and their soils went away. So did ours in the 1920s. They called it the Dust Bowl. Right? It's happened historically, the cliffs of the Anasazi, the hanging gardens of Babylon and Iraq, and I'm not some, you know, passionate environmental wacko. I'm looking at my backyard and going, how many deer could I manage here if I planted 36 apple trees? And maybe if I planted them so that they produced from June into November, maybe I could have enough deer to support a deer a month for my family. What can I do with the rabbits and the groundhog? They're meat too, and raccoons. And since I'm on that, since I'm planting for food, apples and deer, I mean, there's a meal right there. <laughs> what about medicine? What plants are hardy enough that I don't have to spend all day in a garden weeding because they're rugged and they're more nutritious and they're just as effective as modern medicine? Like comfrey and stinging nettle and oak and beach. And maybe I'll plant them and won't see them because, you know, I'll be dead long before those black walnuts start producing, but the people who are here next will. And what does that mean for me in interacting with my own kind? You know, I want to make dang sure that whoever takes over this land knows what's been invested in previous generation so they can continue on with that story of manifesting bounty. In short, if I'm not in this journey providing some opportunity to people to become part of a solution, no matter what problem they think is going on in the world, then I'm not doing them a service and I'm not doing my job. It's not about the doom and gloom. That comes. You don't have to look for it. It's going to find you. CNN, Fox News, talk radio. It doesn't matter what political affiliation. It's mostly doom and gloom. And then there's the commercials where they say, are you feeling depressed? Try this medication. It'll make the parts of your body fall off, shrivel up, and cease to work. Ain't no leakage is to be expected, but you may be happy. Now back to the news, right? So you don't need to go searching for that. What you, what you could probably benefit from is some options and opportunities to help resolve some of the tension that you feel when you come across those invisible walls or smacks in the back of the head. Hmm, grocery source, pretty fragile system there. Or, hmm. Our, our primary source of food is rich in corn syrup, enriched flour, and is more addicting than heroin. Maybe I want to do something about that. What can I do about that? Right. That's survival attitude. It's becoming proactive instead of reactive. So we have this, and this might help confirm some things. You might already know this, but this is my last bit. We have these degrees of evolutionary process. White belt, black. Boy Scout, Eagle Scout. Person who's first into your class, I want to learn it all. Big knives, coals, I want a fire steel bigger than a fire hydrant. Right? The new guy. Big saucer like eyes, super motivated, kind of annoying sometimes, is going to burn a hole in the carpet when they get home with their virtual set. That's just how it is. That's how we all are with it. Time to celebrate with that one. That East energy that inspired everything is new eyes. 
That's what's going to carry you through the rest. In the southeast, it's peer mentoring. You find a friend who's interested in it too, and now you start hanging out with each other, and your skills start to explode because you have somebody to play against. Me and Chris Whitten for 25 years, right? In the south, you become a specialist, and it's almost like it can come off as an arrogant type of energy sometimes, but it's not. You're just a specialist. So if somebody in the east is going to come up. Hey, do you like bushcraft or outdoor skills? And I'm going to blah blah blah, and they're just going 90 miles an hour. This guy. Well, yeah, it's all good, but particularly I'm interested in percussion flaking and uh, friction fire. The rest of it's all right, but and then that person goes off into the nuances of, you know, the double blindfolded leg drill or something weird like that. And we have specialists. We're really good at specializing. Out here in Western culture, it's not just you're a doctor. <laughs> you specialize in teeth. Knees, ankles, ears, sinuses. So specialization, it serves us well, but it's also a, a frailty in the processes of all of the life around us. Who are the first to go? Who are the first to go extinct when an environment changes? It's the specialists. The generalists stay. So we're going to have cockroaches for a while. But where's the dodo? Where's, where are those giant birds in New Zealand and Australia? What happened to all those giant turtles? They became so highly specialized that when their environment shifted, they couldn't adjust and now they're gone. Right? So kudos to specialization. We need masters and craftsmen. But we also need generalists who are raised by villages of masters and craftsmen of a lot of things. Right? The Southwest is a time to get out of the nest. Right? So people come through this program, they keep coming back, they keep coming back, and after a while they're gone. And I find out they're at roots or they're at Tom's, or they're at Wilderness Awareness School, or they're at, in Ohio with Dave. I used to be like, oh, what did I do wrong? Now I'm like, oh, cool. They're in that space where they're going out to see what else is out there as a journeyman. And you still hear this language in the old guild construct of electrical work, carpentry, right? They're a journeyman. They're out striking it on their own, away from the shadow of their mentors. And they might even be killing their Buddha a little bit on their way, but that's, that's okay, that's to be expected. And they're figuring out their own voice and what works and what doesn't for them on their walk. And when they settle down, and it might be they come back, usually not, they start their own thing. They find their own niche, their own community, they end up finding a partner and getting married, but they start becoming their own entity with it, and they're in what we call the West or the community building stage. Right? So when I met Dave four years ago or three years ago, the first thing that hit me was this is a community. These people are here for something more than just skills. And you can see it. People around campfires, laughing, talking to each other, doing the King of the Hill thing with, you know, hanging out and sharing stories because they hadn't seen each other in a few months or years. It was powerful. That was definitely West Energy. You look at Dave now through my eyes, and I see somebody getting in touch with their ancestral past, with the Long Hunter stuff, and getting back to the, the period pieces of the people who had gone before. Right? What did the people do here 50, 100, 300, 1,000 years ago? And how could we implement that and incorporate that into our walk? Because they weren't stupid. They had larger craniums and they had a better diet. And you know, i got to tell you, there's a learning curve that's more important when something's going to eat you or when your little ones are hungry rather than a gold star and report card. Right? So they weren't stupid. <laughs> and that's what the Northwest is all about. I really can't talk to you about the North. I see it in Grandfather Ray. You know, his, his hair is white, he climbs like a squirrel, and he's in his late 60s, master guide for longer than I've been alive. But he holds this peace and, and sense of belonging that just calms everybody down. So I don't know what it's all about. I can look at it and say, that's what I want to be when I grow up, but I'm in no hurry to be there yet. You know? So there's this matrix then, uh, for me, and this is an artificial construct that drives this school. It's not the only way by far but it's bring them through the Boy Scout stuff into and toward the native stuff, wean people off the dependency of, of tools, and then when, when they get that proficiency level, bring them back to those other tools with a new, a new sense of thankfulness and purpose. I don't know anybody who can do a bow drill and suddenly forget how to use a lighter, but everyone I know who can do a bow drill fully appreciates that lighter when it's in their hands. And it doesn't work the other way around. People who've never seen a bow drill and have only used lighters, 
will mock you as you're trying to get that coal. Hey, you want to borrow my lighter? Or that ain't going to work. What are you doing? Yeah. Don't rub sticks together. Because it's not part of the reality, so it doesn't exist. Right? That's it in a nutshell. That's it. When people come here, we're, we're ambassadors to something, and we don't know what it is for them, but something out there that's real and isn't defined by any, any other human being. And we just get step out of the way once it starts going. Thank you, sir. Yes. Thank you.